So this is Bill Doley, President and CEO of Archaeology Southwest, and I want to welcome you all. Um, it's, a, it's great to get together with you. Uh, again, it was just three weeks ago that we had our first one of these uh, Zoom broadcast uh, archaeology cafes. And while these continue to be really challenging times, uh, I actually have found that my sanity has been maintained by the ability to connect digitally with uh, our staff, uh, others of you out on the landscape there. Um, and it's five weeks at home uh, would be uh, uh, intolerable uh, without this kind of coming together. And the ability to bring us together into a digital community tonight is really important. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, my screen shows that there's at least 256 of you out there right now. Um, and so there's three of us here in Tucson, all in different places. John Welch, uh, myself, and Linda Pierce are uh, spread out over different parts of Tucson. Tucson being the traditional uh, territory of the Tana Autumn Nation. Uh, Octavius Seatua is up in Zuni. Um, he's, which is in modern New Mexico, but it's also on the Zuni Reservation, which is a portion of the traditional lands of the Pueblo of Zuni. And we got your, uh, your zip codes as you signed up for the, for the cafe uh, a week ago or a day ago, whenever you signed in. And it really helps us understand the broad community that's come together here tonight. Pretty much all of North America is represented somewhere out in this uh, community that we've pulled together here. And I want each of you to pause a moment and think about the <clears throat> native peoples whose traditional lands surround you tonight. And a quick uh, review of some logistics. Uh, you can see on the screen right now, this is a sponsored uh, series of talks, uh, our Archaeology Cafe. Arizona Humanities and the Smith Living Trust make this possible. The theme of this series throughout the year, this is our last of, of the planned um, Archaeology Cafe series, has been on visiting the places of the past. And obviously the COVID-19 pandemic has limited um, uh, our abilities to go visit places and uh, travel, but we still want to prime you uh, tonight for future visits. So I'm going to turn it over now to John Welch, who's the director of Archaeology Southwest Landscape and Site Preservation Program. And John has invited Octavius Seautua of the Pueblo of Zuni to share his perspective on these two special places, Casa Malpais and Kanishpa. So John and Octavius, thank you for coming. And I'm going to bow out here and I'll return at the end. Thank you so much, Bill, and thank you, Linda, for all your amazing work keeping us um, logistically organized and uh, drawing in this terrific crowd. It's uh, a little intimidating to um, know that there's 250 something people there. And so I, that's, maybe that's the reason why I decided to, to reach out and bring Octavius in to join me in the, as a co-conspirator and co-host for talking about these, these two places, Casa Mal Pais, uh, and Kanishpa and the elusive promise of archaeological tourism. I have to tell you that I had no idea when I selected the title back in January or whatever it was that just how elusive the promise of archaeological tourism was going to be. Um, I also, of course, had no idea that we would be uh, coming together in this time of pandemic, a time with um, a great deal of hardship and uncertainty um, in many communities, but not, uh, not the least of which being Native communities and so um, just taking a minute to recognize that, uh, you know, uh, our, we have loved ones, friends and colleagues um, in Apache land and uh, Zuni land and Hopi land and Akama land and elsewhere who uh, are experiencing some real hardship. So um, hats off to them and hats off to our friends and colleagues uh, and folks that have friends and colleagues south of the border in Mexico on, on this uh, Cinco de Mayo. So Viva Mexico, Viva Apache, Viva Zuni, Viva Hopi. Um, nothing quite says 
free, fun, and lively like webinar. And so we'll just do our best to keep things moving along tonight to have some fun along the way um, and do the best we can, as Bill said, to prepare you and prime you for being able to return to um, the places that we love to know more about and to explore um, through archeology span and through archeological perspectives and also through native people's perspectives. So what I wanna do is start off with making sure we know where the places are that we're talking about and place them in geographical context by changing our screen briefly to a Google Earth presentation that I put together that shows where we are uh, in the regions that we're talking about right along the eastern northern part of Arizona and the uh, western part of northern uh, New Mexico. Uh, and so the Google Earth tour starts really at the top of the most important set of mountain ranges, the White Mountains, Arizona's White Mountains, again, right on the, the, the New Mexico-Arizona state line, and the source of the waters that flow to the north through the town of Springerville and right past Casa Malpais uh, into the Little Colorado River. This is where you would begin your tour when the time comes just north of those mountains and a little bit to the east in beautiful downtown Springerville at the Casa Malpais Archaeological Park and Museum. They will take you or guide you just north of town, a short distance to Casa Malpais itself, right on the edge of mid-tertiary lava flows, a scenic spot tucked right in against the escarpment of those lava flows. And then we're also going to visit uh, the territory that is drained by the Black River and White River uh, complex, just outside of the modern town of White River itself, which is the seat of government for the White Mountain Apache tribe, the owner and steward for uh, Kanishba Ruins National Historic Landmark, and for another National Historic Landmark, the Fort Apache and Theodore Roosevelt School National Historic Landmark, just south of the town of White River. And this is where you would begin your tour of Kanishba at the Apache Culture Center and Museum at Fort Apache. Uh, Kanishba is managed in conjunction with the Fort Apache um, property and is located just a short four miles away up to the west and north. There's Kanishba ruins itself coming into focus there where you can see the excavated and rebuilt portion of the site there as well as just to the north of that the excavated but not rebuilt portion of the big room block and then the museum that was built in the late 1930s and in the early part of the 1940s in order to provide a, a tourist destination for people visiting Kanishba and the region more generally and then uh, there's also a large portion of the site on the west side of this little draw this spring-fed draw that is unexcavated and unreconstructed and so that's where um, the places that we'll be visiting, we won't be able to visit except through uh, Octavius, the Pueblo of Zuni itself today, but we have a color-coded uh, pin flag there to keep track of our friend Octavius. If he moves around, then it's gonna track him down so he can not get away from providing his insight and, and assistance to us as we proceed. So I'm gonna go back to this slideshow from here. So we can resume talking about this place and promise that the next slide is the only one that is super text heavy. It's a way of getting a bunch of facts together and presenting them for you for those who have particular interest, you can zero in on it. Uh, Kanishpa throughout the presentation on the left part of your screen and Casa Malpais presented with information and pictures on the, on the right part of your screen. Um, Kanishba, it's safe to say, may be among the, the sites that has the most different names. It has a Hopi name, Maipavi, uh, an Apache name, Kidahwa. Um, it was called by the cavalry there at Fort Apache, the Fort Apache ruin. And then we've got a variety of names that archaeologists call it. 
Uh, Casa Malpais is, you know, would translate from the Spanish as Lava Rock House or House of the Badlands. Um, again, Kanishpa is located on White Mountain Apache tribe land. Uh, Casa Malpais was located until about 1992 on Arizona state land, um, but was acquired by the town of Springerville specifically as a tourist destination, as a, as a site for archaeological tourism. I mentioned that Casa Malpais is on the edge of a mid-tertiary lava flow, um, just above the Little Colorado foot floodplain. It's there quite high, just below 7,000 feet. Uh, Kanishpa is significantly lower there in a nice broad meadow fringed with pine trees at about 5,000 feet. I think something that matters a lot if you're a corn farmer to have this kind of elevational difference. They share a period of occupation from about 1200 to about 1400. Um, so, you know, um, uh, similar in that particular way. Kanishpa is significantly larger, um, between 600 and 800 original rooms. So about 10 times the size of Casa Malpais. Um, not sure exactly how to explain that. We'll get into some ideas about that later on. The two places are also important and unified because of the investments in public architecture, communal spaces that people shared. So formal plazas, the Kishmikanishpas with an entry from the south. Um, there's a great kiva that was made out of the uh, Kanishpa Plaza when it was roofed later in the occupation, sometime in the 1300s. Casa uh, Malpais started off with a large great kiva that we'll see photographs of. And um, both sites were occupied, as I said, until about the 1400s. <clears throat> and um, then were used occasionally uh, for ceremonial purposes and visiting purposes by uh, uh, Zunis, Hopis, uh, Akamos at Fort Apache, Akama people at Fort Apache. And then uh, first at Kanishpa, Byron Cummings took an interest in the place in the 1930s as a site where he would be able to settle in and spend his dotage uh, doing excavations with students and colleagues and then building a monument, a two Native American civilization there at Kanishpa. And so invested um, significant energy through the last part of his life, starting when he was 69 years old. For those of you who may feel like you don't have as much energy as you used to, he took on the excavation of a 600 room Pueblo and the reconstruction of it, as well as the creation of a museum there at, uh, at, at Kanishpa. So let it be the inspiration for you. Um, his vision sort of culminated with the idea of transferring Kanishpa to the National Park Service and making it into a national monument. Ultimately, however, the Park Service declined that idea and, um, and uh, could not reach terms with the White Mountain Apache tribe for detailed reasons and political in part. Um, and so instead it was turned into a National Historic Landmark in 1964. And then, uh, the White Mountain Apache tribe more formally adopted it and started to manage it actively as part of the, the Fort Apache uh, uh, Historic Park in 1992. And so, you, so there you see the sort of sequence of plan A, B, C, and D for, for Kanishpa, a little bit less complicated at Casa Malpais, where, as I mentioned, the town of Springerville first had also the idea of it becoming a National Historic Park administered by the National Park Service. That, that idea the Park Service also declined to implement. And instead, the site, the, instead of being deterred by that, the city of Springerville continued on its path and has done a terrific job of maintaining uh, Casa Malpais as an archeological um, destination as part of its uh, overall economic development and sort of town, um, town profile. Um, a, a terrific contribution to the culture and history of Arizona. Um, here are some places you can visit. I'm not going to read through them while you're in the neighborhood uh, visiting these sites. And it would be wrong not to start right off by acknowledging that the remarks that I'm making and your ability to visit these sites are really in a lot of ways due to a number of different sustained investments on the part of the White Mountain Apache Tribe at Arizona State Parks, um, the National Park Service, 
uh, including what I, I first misspelled as the Pers Persevere America program. It's actually the Preserve America program, but I think Persevere in some ways is more fitting. And so I decided to leave that typographical error in on for Kanishka as well as for uh, Kasama Pais, who's also been sponsored by the Persevere America program, um, the Little Colorado River chapter of the Archaeological, uh, Arizona Archaeological Society, the National Trust for Historic Preservation, and Archaeology Southwest has had a significant um, contribution in both of the sites as well. So they share identities as expansion outposts for the uh, proliferation and fluorescence of Puebloan culture in the 1200s and 1300s into the 1400s, um, coming out of the north and moving into the south southern area along this Mogollon Rim and the, the greater White Mountain area. They also share similarities as what I'll refer to as kind of a combination of emulations and rejections associated with Chaco Canyon and the Chacoan system that Paul Reed talked about three weeks ago. Um, I'm arguing that we should at least give them consideration as potential cities and that they share many attributes of cities and so deserve that, that consideration. Um, they're crossroads of uh, traffic in people and in commodities and in design styles and ideas. And so they share those similarities and they share similarities as case studies in, pre in preservation archeology span and most especially in the imperative embedded in preservation archeology span to basically adapt or die, to go with the values that are dominant at the time and um, conserve and work on those values. Here are the, some of the people that were, have been involved in uh, in the preservation of these places and the caretaking of them. It's another um, thing that they really have in common that no archeologists alive today have participated in sort of primary big excavation focused projects at either of these sites. Instead, uh, those people are gone now. And so we have to rely on their records and on the information that they've left behind and on the good works that they did. Um, and so on the left is uh, Byron Cummings and some of the dozens of Apache people that participated with him working on the excavation and reconstruction of, of, of uh, Kanishba. For um, the best part of 12 years, very busy at this, at this site to create this, this, the, his idea of this monument. And then on the, the right, just a few of the many dozens of volunteers uh, mostly Arizona Archaeological Society volunteers involved in taking care of uh, Casa Malpais by, by stabilizing it and taking care of the site to make sure it's safe and pleasant and informative to visit. So great contributions there. Um, yeah, that's right. So it's also important, um, at least for me, that um, these places, the Pueblos that nobody really knows, are actually attractive to me. And I think they should be attractive to you all too, those of you who don't know a lot about them, because in part because not a great deal has been written about what exactly happened and what the meaning of what happened at Kanishpa and Casa Malpais. Not that much has been written down about it. It means that your experience of them, your visit of them, to them, makes it uh, uh, possible for you to do your own interpretation and learn a lot through your own senses and through hopefully a little bit of the perspectives that we'll be sharing in the, the discussion that we'll have after my brief presentation here. Um, these sites have not been forgotten per se, um, obviously, since we're talking about them here, but they're not exactly, you know, the places where, you know, waves of research are crashing on their shores. Um, there's lots to be learned and known about it still from listening to people like, Octav Oct like Octavia Seotua, who will comment later, and through other and to other native uh, representatives of native communities about the places, and again to your own your own senses of it. So, um, just to give you this sort of semi aerial view, um, hopefully this is keyed in from our Google Earth tour. This is the portion of of Kanishba centered on this big plaza that Byron Cummings and his crews um, excavated and reconstructed. Between here 
and the, the room block extending up to the north um, from the reconstructed portion, they dug about 200 rooms in only about 10 years. So that's a pretty good clip, an average of 20 room Pueblo rooms a year um, to get take care of this. The, the, they did not reconstruct this portion of the Pueblo. Instead, they made use of the sort of extra uh, building stone in order to build this museum structure, now itself going into ruin. And this uh, room block also going back into ruin for the second or third time, depending on how you, you reference it. So again, the big plaza area. And then this will be, for those of you who have visited Kanishpa or will visit it, this is sort of the orientation overlook spot, um, this, this round uh, sort of patio feature here. At Casa Mal Pais, you will be guided by a, it's a self-guided tour at Kanishpa. For Casa Mal Pais, you're guided by an expert guide who will take you along a trail, um, allowing you to visit uh, the room blocks itself, this big circular area, and the Great Kiva that we'll have uh, a bigger view of, as well as going up to the top of the, the, the lava flow, looking out from the escarpment itself over the site to get a better feel for what it consists of. So I mentioned the word monuments. Um, they've been recognized by the National Park Service and by the United States government as landmarks. Um, to me, the places are uh, monumental in a number of different ways. Um, here's a different way of looking at the sites, including uh, the better view of the way that the Great Kiva is oriented or connected up with the big uh, room block at, at Casa Mal Pais and the lava escarpment there where the overlook is. Um, that to me, they, they rate as monuments worthy of consideration also because um, as uh, was originally inclined by Byron Cummings, who had the fiercest sort and most enduring sort of admiration for Native American people for the ingenuity and the resilience of the builders and occupants of these places for being able to find ways to live in challenging environments and to thrive, make all the contributions that they did make. Um, there are also monuments to the ongoing stewardship uh, for the White Mountain Apache tribe in the town of Springerville. Um, hopefully also to the merits of place-based learning and preservation archaeology. Um, uh, uh, the idea uh, embedded in both places that if we can get them through these times and carry them forward to leave for the next generation um, to decide what to do with, that there's a chance that the next generation may learn more discover more and put them to new uses. That's a, an amazing idea and uh, one that Byron Cummings in many ways sort of founded with his idea of um, enabling visitors to see the reconstructed bits, to appreciate the amount of work and what went into excavating and leaving a site without his uh, interpretive reconstruction and also allowing viewers to see an unexcavated Pueblo and experience what it was like. So um, pretty insightful and um, thoughtful way of approaching it. So the last thing that there are monuments to then is really to respectful reinterpretation and reuse, this idea embedded in preservation archeology. span So we're asking you to just add your imagination, your intelligence and your own industry in order to help make sense of and carry these places forward. One of the many questions that comes up about um, Kanishpa and, and Casa Mal Pais is, are these sort of the dead ends of the system and set of social dynamics set in motion by the Chaco system and the Chaco world? Or are they the beginnings of modern Pueblo culture and society? Um, or maybe most properly, are they both? And so you can see on uh, the right of the screen, a, um, a map familiar from the previous uh, talk that Paul gave, um, hopefully connecting things up a little bit to show uh, Casa Mal Pais at the farthest extent of the southern uh, part of the Colorado Plateau area and uh, the area that was occupied by great kivas um, shortly after the Chaco system. So if it was great houses and uh, roads 
mostly focused on areas north of Chaco. Uh, the Chaco system and its antecedents gave rise to this proliferation of great kivas on the farthest southern extent along the Mogollon Rim here, including the great kivas at Kanishba and at Casamal uh, Pais. So, so we like the idea maybe that it is both in effect, the end and the beginning. Um, to the question of whether or not these places qualify as cities, um, if we keep things in sort of relative terms and understand them in their context as central or pivotal places in complex uh, settlement systems, and we understand them as uh, places that like other central places in settlement systems are networked with peers and subordinates. And we understand them as places that are linked in complicated and complex ways via trails, shrines, communal architecture, um, resource procurement zones, craft specializations, and the uh, spatialization of uh, ritual activities and ceremonial activities inside of these, these settlements, inside of the Pueblos itself, then we can see that there's a combination of social diversity and architectural diversity that's reflective of co-residence uh, and that is another indicator of city-like status. So here's Byron Cummings with his uh, sort of signature pith helmet in the plaza that was uh, again roofed over late in the occupation sequence as a great kiva, um, his reconstructed plaza at Kanishpa, um, providing a tour to, uh, the, I believe, the, the wife of the photographer, um, Yosef Monk. Um, and so uh, Cummings maintained a continuous dedication to taking care of this Kanishwa place, to using it to inspire and to educate um, right through into his 80s, uh, including when he finally yielded control to younger folks, some of his students, the Schaefers, and we'll see a photo, uh, an image produced by one of them here in a minute, um, um, taking up residence in one of the Pueblo rooms that he had, had, uh, he had built. Oops. Nobody has taken up residence that I know of, uh, despite the dedication to uh, the preservation of the place at Casa Malpais. But um, uh, the artist Heather Kirstens has done us this favor of uh, producing this reconstruction, uh, artistic reconstruction of, of Casa Malpais that identifies it as a substantial uh, architectural investment, also a very important place. And certainly when we look at the um, artifacts, especially the ceramics, we understand the, the amount of investment in the, the crafts and in the networking, uh, the maintenance of networks across, across quite vast regions. So the question of who we're talking about, um, also in some ways a complicated one, and in some ways a simpler one. Um, it is the Western Pueblo people that we're talking about, the ancestors of the Zuni people, the Hopi people, and the Yakima people. If, it, if these people, if these places represent portions or parts of their stories, some of the footprints of the origins of their current Pueblo traditions at these three main concentrations of modern Pueblo life, um, we can appreciate some of their antecedents by understanding the diversity of ceramic design styles that came to be represented in the proliferation of ceramics that were um, created and traded through both Kanishpa and Casamal Pais. So on the left there is, is Margaret Schaefer's attempt to provide a, a, a sort of infographic early on uh, dating to the mid 50s about how that worked at Kanishpa. And then here is uh, work from the Southwest um, 
social networks project and the, the, the precursor to the incredible Cyber Southwest project that is taking shape at Archaeology Southwest to demonstrate some of the richness and variety of settlement that occurred uh, through uh, time periods. This first map starting from 1150 and going to 1275 to show this early pulse of settlement um, all around uh, the region. Um, the next map indicating the, the aggregation, the concentration of that more widespread settlement into the beginnings, at least, of a few concentrated places at Grasshopper, Q Ranch, at Kanishpa, in the Point of Pines region, um, in the area around uh, Casamal Pais, and very strongly going down the Little Colorado River. Um, past the uh, um, Homolavi ruins um, there between Holbrook and, and Winslow. And then lastly, um, to the concentration of Western Pueblo people in the modern settlements of Akama, Zuni, and Hopi. So pretty fast paced, especially from an archeological point of view, vigorous, thorough expansion that involved um, careful selection of all of the places suitable for occupation by village dwelling, uh, corn farming uh, people all through the area that we, just, that we just covered. They effectively identified every single place that was suitable for settlement. Talk about that in just another minute or so. And this is to remind us that not only did they do this work um, by creating sites, but also, and, and institutions, but also by the uh, creation of these incredible ceramics that define and provide insight into their, um, their expansion. Cibola whitewares, dominated by jars here on the top. Beautiful white mountain redware, the earlier varieties on the bottom. Oops, here are the later varieties of white mountain redware and the polychrome bits, including a fairly rare pictorial bull from not too far away at all from Casa Mal Pais. The signature pottery type for the White Mountain region. And then later in time, um, Zuni glazewares at both of these sites occur with some um, frequency, not as high as the White Mountain frequency, but also provide key indicators of the um, sustained and important connections between people and places. So um, the next question then is that if they were so successful in creating these amazing sites, um, building the communal spaces in order to define and hold their communities together, then why was there so much movement? Why not simply settle in? Um, what led people to the region to begin with, uh, the, the Mogollon Rim region, the White Mountain region to begin with? Um, uh, what sustained them and why did they move on? Are the questions involved in this? And this is a question that, um, again, you can participate in answering by using your observations as you travel through the region between Kanishpa and uh, Casamal Pais. Hopefully, as you travel over the White Mountains, maybe between Casamal Pais or Kanishpa and the Chaco region, driving down the Little Colorado River Valley uh, through St. John's and on to through the Petrified Forest on to towards Holbrook. Um, if we take a broader perspective and try to understand these places in relationship to Chaco Canyon, since that's where we sort of left off with Paul Reed's presentation a few weeks ago, then it may be useful to understand the movement, the expansion into the White Mountain area in terms of, uh, as Steve Lexon has and other scholars of migration have thought about, in terms of pushes, the things that were driving and motivating people, um, as well as, as pulls. So for pushes, we have the dissolution of the Chaco system. 
um, you know, by the, the mid 10 hundreds and later, people were um, on to the next thing one way or another and reacting, we think, in some ways against the Chaco system. There are indications in the archeological records uh, of the area around Chaco and other places in the Four Corner regions uh, of food scarcity, of strife, of uncertainty uh, about their neighbors and some of their neighbors' intentions. There's indications of the rejection of power and authority concentrations, um, people not comfortable continuing to participate in those systems. In the 1270s, the mid 1270s, there is, as most people will know, um, a serious a drought that takes place and that continues on for 20 something years, 24, 25 years into the early 1300s that made life there even less comfortable. There may very well be things that we don't know about that uh, may also be pushing people to the South to participate uh, in the creation of something different than Chaco. And so what was it that made it so that they came that direction? Why to the South? Um, you know, what I've got down here uh, to start off with thinking about that is um, great water supply. You know, those mountains, the purpose of the White Mountains, like other mountains, is to create water. And the White Mountains do that quite reliably or have done that quite reliably until quite recently. As water flows, it builds soil systems and it produces, in association with both springs and stream systems, um, nice pockets of arable land. Um, all through the White Mountains uh, and the areas drained by the streams of the White Mountains and the Mogollon Rim are these pockets of good arable land. And then, of course, nice irrigable, irrigable land, arable land, excuse me, along the Little Colorado River Valley. Um, something that is in short supply in many of the Four Corner regions are building timbers and building stone, not so much the building stone, but certainly the timbers. In at Casa Malpais, at Kanishpa, at the other Pueblos that we're talking about in the region, they did not have to go far in order to find building timbers, certainly not up to the Chusca Mountains, the way that the Chaco folks had to go to. Uh, <clears throat> they had in this region also precursors, early investments in the creation of these great Kiva-centered communities in the Forestdale Valley and along the Mogollon Rim that may also have provided alternatives to uh, great house focused Chaco systems. And so last but not least, I think is the draw of community. And the promise at least from some interpretations and this admittedly we do not have unequivocal evidence for that uh, they were interested both in the creation and sustenance of community and in doing so with greater liberty and justice for all in a more democratic, um, less authoritarian, more transparent fashion, one where folks could participate regardless perhaps of birthright. So if it was so great at, uh, along the Little Colorado River in these mountain streams drained by the Mogollon Rim and the White Mountains, why did people leave? And so uh, the first answer to that we have uh, from the people of the Hopi Cultural Resource Advisory Team um, on the left in the Kinishpa Plaza as it looked in 2003 and still looks about like this, helping me to identify the, the extent of the, the shrine feature there in that plaza um, and the representatives uh, of the, the Zuni Cultural Resource Advisory Team um, led by Octavia Siotawa, who we will hear from shortly, um, at, a, at a plaza um, at Benito Creek Pueblo um, uh, as part of a, a project we did with T.J. Ferguson years back. So the answer that would come um, from them is uh, they didn't abandon these sites. They didn't abandon these regions. It's still important in Hopi and Zuni traditions, and certainly the Casa Malpai is also important in Akama. Um, oral traditions and cultural traditions. Um, but they did leave. And uh, uh, in terms of steady, regular occupation. And the answer to that, um, I will leave for, for Octavius to touch on if he wish, wishes. But it's enough to know, I think, for us, and to conclude what I want to say, that uh, the oral traditions still preside, 
provide sources of inspiration and guidance for understanding these places, for uh, allowing us to appreciate and experiencing them in, in respectful fashions as ancestral sites of great importance in, uh, uh, to people today, as well as to archeologists who continue to learn about them and, and be inspired and, and, uh, and uh, enthralled in many ways by them. So with that, um, I will unshare my screen and ask Octavius to turn on his video so that he can provide reflections on my remarks and also um, offer to the audience whatever else he would care to. So thanks again so much for being with us, Octavius. Well, thank you for inviting me. And uh, like I keep saying all the time is when I'm asked to do a, a presentation or talk about our people is that uh, we come from a long line of people that that had the sense of community life. Um, we had uh, just recently our whole uh, system has changed because of the constitution that the Zuni tribe adopted. But in the past, we had our religious leaders as being the uh, primary uh, people, making sure that the community lifestyle, the community way of the Pueblo and people was carried on. And some of my, uh, my friends up in the uh, Rio Grande community still practice the, uh, uh, the, that type of uh, theoretical form of government that they appoint their own governors, but because we have a constitution that we have to elect our governor here in Zuni. But um, like what John was talking about, uh, our people were very resilient. They um, came to these places and uh, built uh, settlements, uh, places of worship, places that they could um, raise a family, do their farming. But because it was not the ideal place, we were all instructed to look for our middle place, center of the universe for the Hopi. Uh, but we have had our destination that was given to the people to look for their own uh, place that they could um, call their own, like here in Zuni, Shewina. And so the people were roaming, looking for their own destinations. And when they did uh, uh, produce and build settlements, different people came in. And uh, even to this day, the community of lifestyle of our Pueblo and people, uh, if you come to our shot local here, you're, you're invited, you're, you're welcome. And uh, to the feast uh, up in the Rio Grande tribes in Acoma and Laguna, it's the same thing, hos hospitality is. It's a big thing for when we do our celebrations, our, our, our way of connecting back to our people that were there a long time ago. And that's the community, the lifestyle that they shared, the way they lived. And so we still follow the same teachings of our ancestors a long time ago. And so when they left, they, like what John mentioned, they didn't abandon it because we go back. And when we do go back to these sites, leave an offering and uh, reconnect back to our ancestors is, is, is our way of honoring and, and holding that, these special places uh, within our, our memories, our, our ancestral teachings is to go back and uh, revisit these areas so that these places will never be lost. And I think it's very important that uh, that we as the, the people that came from these places be given a chance to talk about our people because in the past it was always this mention of abandonment, which we never did. Uh, we had different destinations that were, that were given to each Pueblo and people. The Hopis have their mesas, the Zunis have their own separate uh, place, uh, Acoma, Laguna, but they're Pueblo and people. They're the same people, um, the same community way of lifestyle here in Zuni is the same in Acoma, Hopi, uh, uh, 
Santa Ana, Santo Domingo, if you go to these places, they have kivas, they have uh, plazas, and Kanishpa and uh, Casa Pais also have uh, kivas and plazas. So it's just a continuation of our people uh, that were there. We're the same people that, uh, but the only thing that has changed is time and the clothes that we wear on our back, otherwise our ceremonies are still the same. We practice, practice the same way our ancestors, when they were there, uh, you come to Zuni and witness our ceremonies. It's the same ceremonies that were done a long time ago. We were given these ceremonies and were taught at a young age to carry on these uh, particular uh, different ceremonies, different times of the year. Uh, the planting, the gathering, uh, the harvesting, all these have different, and we had, uh, we still have religious leaders here in Zuni that uh, takes on uh, the whole calendar, calendar year for the Zuni people here. So it was done there. They had the uh, religious leaders uh, pick the calendar year. And to this day in 2020, we still have our head rain priest that does the same thing. So it, it hasn't changed. Uh, we're now riding in vehicles. Um, they had their own two feet to carry them wherever they wanted to go. And uh, they were very, like I said, they were very resilient. Um, no distance was too far for them. Um, so it's, it's, it's amazing that, that uh, this information is still there because we're, we want to protect these places because that's our whole history. That's telling people that come to areas like this about the Pueblo and lifestyle, the Pueblo and people. And uh, I'm all for saving uh, all these different places. And uh, I'm thankful to a lot of these archeologists that, that have are, um, either reconstructed or have left them alone. And to this day, we, as the Zuni people would like to have these places protected because I've talked to a lot of people and they always say that, well, where, where's information about your history? It's not in written anywhere. And I, say, I tell them, if you go to a site, you see the history there. And that's our living history. It, it's not dead, it didn't pass away. So all of these places still have that history of our people. And um, I hope it never changes because of what's happening right now, you know, we go through different times and like our ancestors went through a lot of different hardships, but they managed to pull through. They managed to keep our culture and our way of life to uh, the Pueblo and people. And uh, we're, we're gonna be here as long as these sites are there, that that's our information, that's our, our history, our living history, our libraries of our people that, that were there. And uh, I'm glad to be a little part of this presentation because I want people to understand and learn that these places will never be forgotten. It's part of who we are. And growing up, um, hearing about all these different places, not knowing where they were until I became part of the advisory team and was given a chance to go to all of these places. And it's amazing that, that the memory, the history of our ancestors, how they talked about these places. And you come to a place where you just remember in, your, in the words coming from your elders and come into a place like Casamel uh, Pais, Kanishpa. It's like they were painting a picture for us growing up and, and here I'm standing at one of the uh, pictures that they painted for me a long time ago. So uh, all these places will always be important to the Pueblo and people, not just Topi and Zuni, Akama, but Lagunas, all the other Pueblo and people are part of who we are. The, we are the same people. We just had different places to go. And that's not what uh, a lot of people have been talking about, but hopefully with presentations like this that even our Puebloan brothers will come to an understanding that 
we are the same people. Uh, it's just that we were given a, a destination, a different place to look for our own, like we call the middle place, Itiwana, Halona Itiwana here in Zuni. And we found it, so we're here. The Laguna people found their place. The Hopi people found their place. They're center, the center of the universe. So all these different places were a testament to of our, uh, of our people, <laughs> the resilience of, of our people uh, surviving all these different hardships, different problems that they were given, they pulled through and uh, survived. And here we are, we're, we're still here. We'll always be here as, as the, the Ashui, the, 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 the Zuni people, the Hopi, the, the Akama. Um, we're going to be here, hopefully, um, giving information like this for people to really understand who the Pueblo people are. And uh, like I mentioned, I'm glad to be a, a part of this because I want people to know that these places have never been abandoned. They're always going to be important to us. And uh, like John mentioned that um, this word abandonment now is, is a thing, a word of the password for us now, because it was a big part of information that was put by past archaeologists. When they put that information out about different sites, there was always that word abandonment put in. But now with uh, with Bill and um, and John here and, and uh, Paul and all the people that I work with now are using different words to um, identify all these different sites. And they, they're they all the same. It might be Chaco, it might be uh, Mesa Verde, but they're all Pueblo and people because of the lifestyle, the community lifestyle, the, the sharing of uh, duties to prepare and, and uh, complete ceremonies and uh, all these things that that were practiced in all these different places are still done within our Pueblo communities and with that uh, I want to invite um, our first summer rain dance is coming in June and it's open to the public uh, it's a start of our, our summer dances and all of our dances are open to the public too. So anybody that wants to come to Zuni, and if there's a dance, they're more than welcome to come to the plaza and watch, because it's a ceremony of, of our people, the ceremony of the Zuni, the, the Laguna, the Hopi, ceremony of our people surviving and being who we are and who will, we will always be as Pueblo people. Uh, with that, thank you. and. Uh, Thank you for inviting me to be a part of this. Thank, thank you, Octavius. I think John's going to come back. I am. Um, we have some questions and answers. John, do you want to put that um, screen back up that lets people know where they can get more information on our website? And. Um, We'll ask some questions. We have some good questions, and hopefully, you guys will have some good answers. Um, I'll let you get your screen up here. Technology, it's a great thing. All right. So I, I'm going to start at the top, <clears throat> and if you have questions, please type them in. We're actually not going to do the raise hand and let you talk. So we need you to type your question in if you want to ask a question. Um, the first question that um, we got this evening was, how do the indigenous peoples whose homeland is Casa Malpais and Kanishpa, how do they benefit economically or in other resources from the tourism on these sites? You might more to say about that? I will happily start off uh, and then... Go ahead, Octavius. Well, uh, we, as Pueblo and people, do not benefit from uh, all of these sites, all the uh, monuments. Uh, but it, it's uh, gratifying. I mean, I'm, I'm thankful that they're there to uh, protect these sites. And that's probably the only benefit that we're getting is, is the 
protection of these sites. We're not uh, getting any monetary or any help from all these monuments, but just knowing that there's somebody out there that wants to protect these sites for future generations is, is uh, you know, it's, it's what we expect from all the national monuments, all these different places that, mm -hmm. that they're protected for perpetuity for our people. And that's the benefit that we get from these sites. I will just um, <clears throat> mention that the economic benefits uh, from archaeological tourism, especially at these particular sites, because they are, um, you know, not located close to big population centers or big um, interstate highways, that uh, it actually costs money uh, to take care of these places. Uh, this town of Springerville, the White Mountain Apache tribe had invested rather than benefited per se um, in caretaking these sites. The White Mountain Apache tribe, it's uh, perceived as an element of obligation to ancestral people who showed Apaches the way to live in that landscape. Uh, for the town of Springerville, it's part of an overall economic development and sort of community branding portfolio that they've made a commitment to. And so uh, there is not a uh, big checks that get cut at the end of any particular year. I was just going to mention, I agree with John, uh, the Apaches, we have a good working relationship with the Apaches. Uh, um, during one of our meetings, uh, one of their elders said that, uh, that they know that these sites that they want to protect are not their people, but since it's on the Apache lands that they needed help from the Hopi and the Zuni uh, Pueblo people to make sure that uh, these places are protected. And that's what I really appreciate about the Apaches, making a bold statement like that. And, uh, uh, you know, if we come to an understanding that we, we can work together to, to save all of these sites, Great. Um, so let's going to go back to Chaco for a minute. Um, could Casa Malpais and Kanishba be considered a somewhat suburbia to Chaco? I think you might have sort of touched on that a little, John. Would you say they were suburbia to Chaco? I would not, simply because they <laughs> post-date the Chaco system. Okay. Uh, and, you know, I would, you know, defer to Chaco scholars to, to talk more about uh, the relationship or the levels of similarity there, but they are not strong. Uh, okay. uh, there is no clear connection in time or uh, tradition other than a general Pueblo developmental sequence that leads to the south and ends up along the Mogollon Rim and in the, in the little Colorado River that connects these places to Chaco per se. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Chaco is wrapped up um, nobody in downtown Chaco and, and, and most of the other major Chaco outliers and great houses and so forth have closed up shop before uh, Kanishba and Casa Malpais really start to boogie in the, the latter 1200s. Cool. What about the general environment in that part of the world? Um, has it changed much since um, those, two, those two cities were actually um, populated? So was it about the same when people were living there? I'll start and then Octavius may have some, because we've had uh, Octavius and other members of the, the Zuni uh, Cultural Resource Advisory Team have commented on this on the basis of their oral traditions as well. Um, it has changed significantly. Uh, the impact of cattle grazing across the region and of the lowering of water tables has significantly impacted the spring flows all along the Mogollon Rim. Uh, agricultural and uh, municipal pumping has made it so that many, many springs that once flowed uh, freely and consistently throughout the year uh, now have been dry for a long, long time. And you add to this um, some of the recent uh, impacts of what I perceive, at least on the basis of my short time in the region, 
uh, going back only to 1983 and inspecting it, I see dramatic changes just in that period of time. And so you add another 100 years of pretty significant environmental change, and, and I believe they are very, very different places. I believe the water tables were much closer to the surface, the springs flowed, the grass was higher, and that farming was significantly easier, especially dry farming in the region. Anything to add to that, Octavius? Okay. Uh, yeah, we've done a lot of work with Chaco uh, and also with, uh, was working there with the Hopis. And uh, we've come to an understanding that these places were inhabited by the Puebloan people. And so when you look at our history, like I mentioned before, is that our, our lifestyle, our way of life, what was done in Chaco was done in, in Casamel Pais because they have plazas and they have kivas. So that lifestyle has, has generated and gone with us uh, to where we are now. So um, that, that type, that part of our history has always been taken with the people during their travels. And wherever they uh, decided to build a settlement is where they practice their, their ceremonies. They built their kivas, they built their plazas. So if you come to a, a, a site that is identified as Pueblo, you know you're gonna be finding uh, kivas, you're, you're gonna be finding plazas. So this is the community lifestyle that we have was done in all these sites that have been uh, identified. And I'm pretty sure that there are sites that have never been identified would also have the same key as in plazas. So mm -hmm. the, the practice of our history and our culture and our way of life has always been with us and it's still done to this day. There's a, thank you. There's a couple questions I'm wondering about, a couple people asking about um, Hoakam, in terms of Hoakam influences, Hoakam interchange, interaction. Anything you could say about how the Hoakam might or might not have been inter interacting with any of these places, John? Or the well, folk that we archaeologists talk about as Hoakam? That's for sure true. Um, the, <clears throat> the evidence that I'm aware of for direct participation of Hoakam, you know, people or representatives of Hoakam culture in this region is very, very limited. Um, I think it's worth noting, though, that toward the end of the occupation sequence at Kanishba, that you do see indications uh, in the settlement system of some reorganization towards greater protection of Kanishba and its sort of subsidiary settlements in the form of fortress positions and investments in uh, uh, special tactically deployed architectural features, walls, battlements, these kinds of things along travel corridors that seem to be oriented towards the Southwest. And so I think that there are, is a sense that I have from working in the area that they are separate systems. Mm. that people were not necessarily consistently on friendly terms. Now, this is true in lots of different ways. You know, we're building a wall along the, the southern boundary of the United States right now without there being any violent conflict or any actual threat of, uh, of violence, um, per se, from, you know, the Mexican government. Now, what that means and how it connects up uh, with a sense of uncertainty that is indicated archaeologically um, by the mid 1300s in the area. I can't say for sure, but it does coincide with um, unsettled conditions, uh, you know, the end of, of a Holocom set of classic periods and the possibility at least of people moving on and looking for other places to live and maybe considering moving into the mountains or, or looking for ways to raid into the mountains. I don't know. 
I'm gonna, a couple more quick questions and then I think I'm gonna have to just remind everybody that there's lots of good questions that keep coming, but um, we will um, do some extended content and do some further an answering of questions at the address you see on, on your screen right now. But quick, quick, easy one probably, John, was did Cummings ever publish a site report on Kanishpa? There is a monograph on Kanishpa. Monograph. I will call it breezy. Um, Call it and what? So Cut out for a minute. Fairly breezy and breezy. more more sort of light in touch. And so the fact is that Cummings was an amazing and inspiring educator, a person dedicated to aspects of um, the preservation and the celebration of Pueblo culture and Native American culture more generally. Um, he was an okay archaeologist. I mean, he was, as you can see from the structure and how fast it's collapsed, a crappy architect and builder. Uh, but his site records and the reports that he left from excavating so quickly, um, using you know Works Progress Administration, Civilian Conservation Corps crews, the Indian Division of the Civilian Conservation Crew, they are not um, um, up to the task of producing an adequate site report. If you look, however, at um, a recent piece of work that my colleagues and I produced, um, this um, Arizona State Museum Archaeological ah. Series book, then there is the best, most recent consideration of the archaeological record at Kanishpa. Um, it's going to have to be left for uh, future generations of scholars to understand more about the place on the basis of the records that he did leave behind. Patrick Lyons, Daniela Triadon, um, uh, others have done a great job of beginning to plumb those uh, excavation records and the collections that Cummings left behind in order to squeeze as much as possible out of out of those out of those documents and collections. Great. And I salute them. Yeah, amazing. Great. And we'll, we'll make sure that that stuff is the bibliography is all up on our website. And um, one final at least question, um, Octavius. Several people have been asking again, yes. what, what, is the, what do you think is the date for the summer rain dance in, in June? Do you, do you know what the date is for that? Uh, You've got some people who I, want to come visit. I was given a date. Uh, okay, what I can do is give that information to Bill or, or John and okay. you can post it up on, on this uh, web page so they can have a, a because it, the date has already been set, okay, and uh, I, I do have it. And of all things, it's in my phone here, so I can <laughs> shut it off and look for it. That'd be wonderful, because now you've got several people who are in the audience who are, if we're allowed to travel and come into Zuni by June, I think they'd love to come come visit you guys. So, I think we probably yeah. should start wrapping up by now. So maybe if Bill wants to come back and join us. Um, I want to thank you guys as Bill comes in. And like I said, we will answer some more questions and try to put more stuff up here on the, um, the web page that you see there. But I'll let Bill uh, wrap it up for us. Well, an obvious uh, thanks, John, Octavius. Um, wonderful presentation on two really amazing places out there on the landscape, Linda. Uh, logistics and question <laughs> delivering. Good job. Um, thank you. Um, we're going to continue um, to offer additional activities like this over the summer. It won't be a formal um, archaeology cafe uh, setting like this, but we're in have other things in the works, and we're looking forward to keeping this preservation archaeology community together um, over the course of time when we're kind of at least either in homes or or not uh, trekking too far across the landscape. So uh, take care of yourselves. Uh, we'll do um, pay attention to that uh, Welch Cafe follow up. Um, there's already material there uh, on online there and there will be more coming. There's a lot of really neat questions that have been asked uh, tonight that we couldn't get to, but we will follow up with them. So uh, again, it's been a great uh, 
series, and this is a great wrap up, um, the comparison of these two places, and I hope they make me want to get back. I've been to them several times and I want to get back. So uh, thanks for telling a, a great story, connecting this to uh, our modern Pueblo uh, communities that are out there on the landscape that uh, are still so deeply connected to these places. So thank you, uh, Octavius, for, for joining us. Uh, it's great to see you. Um, just a real quick, Octavius has been a great voice for Bears Ears, and um, so it's not just um, the places that are right in the immediate vicinity of, of uh, Zuni there. It's a much bigger landscape that is clearly still important to uh, a lot of people whose connections on this land go very, very deep. So I'm going to um, sign off for tonight, and thanks so much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye, Octavius.